we tested candles. Not all candles are the same. You can get really cheap, nasty petroleum candles with horrible thin wicks and you light them and you get this tiny, weedy little flame that just blows out instantly. You can also get candles that smoke too much. You can also get, uh, for film, they often made double or triple wick candles. These are candles that have double or triple braids. So there's a bigger flame, they bright more brightly, burn more brightly. And they were what um, John Alcott and Stanley Kubrick used in um, Barry Lyndon, which is really the kind of first attempt on, in cinema to light only with candlelight, for which they used special NASA lenses, which were T.7, I think. You know, insane fast lenses. And he, I had a special a camera specially adapted to actually hold these these lenses. I think they were only fifty mil, and they only used them for the night scenes. There was no depth of field. I mean, razor fine. So um, Doug Milson had to actually invent a new system of focus pulling using CCTV cameras. I think he was the first person to do it. Revolutionary. But it had it, it was very soft, very fluffy, very flary, and they used double triple wick candles. So you got a like what looks like a bonfire on the table. I mean, some of it did look very beautiful and very painterly, but we weren't necessarily going for that look. We were going for something a bit more rugged. But now there were restrictions on us. The National Trust and the owners of these priceless buildings didn't want us to use double and triple wick candles because the, the flame was too big and because they put up too much smoke. And these places are full of paintings, of tapestries, furniture. And they're quite right, they have to protect these places. So uh, we did a lot of research and actually the best candles were beeswax or beeswax blend candles, which is actually what they would have used in Tudor times. You either had vegetable fat, tallow, tallow, which is animal fat, or beeswax. Beeswax was for rich people, but they burn the cleanest, they don't smell, they don't produce smoke, and they give a beautiful flame. It's a single wick, but it's a thick braid, so you get a solid, quite large flame. And we had a lot, a lot, a lot of candles because obviously you have to think about continuity. Candles burn down at different rates. And if you're cunning between takes, you've got 200 candles up there and then 200 candles down there. So poor art department, who were fantastic, had to cut down and monitor two, 300 candles at a time. We had to light 300 candles and between takes, we'd have to put them all out and then light them again. You had to trim wicks because the wicks got too long and they burned too much. We had to stop them dripping on obviously all this priceless floor and furniture. So once we found a candle that was bright enough, clean enough and looked period, we then had to maintain it. <coughs> and the, the lighting company department helped. Obviously there was a bit of a demarcation because normally candles are props so the art department look after them. But in this instance they were also lighting sources so do the, do the lighting department help? Um, but what, what my gaffer Andy Long did was build a as like a metal tray with a metal back that could hold 20 or 30 church candles, big pillar candles, two, three inches. Um, and we could light those and have those on a wheel stand out of shot. And so I could bring in supplementary fill lighting that was still made of candlelight. And the benefit of that, rather than using a film light, is that it interacts with the atmosphere. So if someone, candlelight actually doesn't flicker all the time. That's why flicker lights don't really look that real. If there's no wind, the candle's sta stable and there's no flicker. But if someone walks past it, it flickers. So what we had with our tray of candles was that if someone walked past the scene, that would move as well, and it would flicker at the same amount of the candles in shot, so we'd get interactive flicker going on. And we could have two or three of these and wheel them in for extra light. What's great is when you get very close, if you, if you blow it up and look at the actor's eye, two things. One, the iris is fully dilated because it's so dark, the, the, the eyes are wide so they can see but the reflections in their eyes are of candles so in in in, in claire, the trial of Anne Boleyn you know you look at Claire's eyes all you see are candles there's no film lights that's always a giveaway you look in the eyes you can see a film light when there's a candle a candelabra all you'll see is candlelight no, nothing else which is really nice I no, I think it's subliminal I know it's there not everyone will notice it but I noticed that that, that it's that it's there another important reason for using candles was there was we couldn't see any other way of lighting we couldn't rig lights to these precious buildings. They're priceless. You can't just clamp a redhead to a 600-year-old piece of wood. You can't put a gantry in. It wouldn't take the load. We were shooting in the summer, so we had to black the windows out. We couldn't light from outside. We couldn't wait for night time. We were handheld with wide lenses doing 180-degree, 360-degree turns. So where do you put your film lights? So again, you know, this is about 
finding a tool to crack a problem or not. That was it. That was, you know, the Alexa with its beautiful look at 1600 SA, T14 lenses that are sharp wide open, solve the problem. All of a sudden, the props are the lights that are producing the source. The next problem then is the fact that these props, normally they're put in to look nice in the scene, but that doesn't necessarily look nice on the actor. So we had to learn how to position candles so that they lit the actors well, but also look correct for the room that they're in. There's a scene where Mark Rylance is working up in the middle of the night. Middle of the night in 1536, it's dark. You can't turn a bedside light on. The fires are all put out. So what do you do? So we did what they did, which was they had little candles, that bedside candles that they would light with a flint probably, and they would use them to light their way down the stairs. And I talked to Mark. Mark didn't want to have to hold a like wee wheeling winky. He didn't want to hold a candle up to light his face because it would be naff, which is what they used to have to have done. I said, no, hold, the, hold it how you would normally. Hold the candle just so you can see where you're going. He's woken up in the middle of the night by Brereton, one of the courtiers to the king. And I'm halfway down this stairway in this 16th century house, completely black. I couldn't see literally a thing. And I've had nightmares like that, where I've woken up in the middle of the, literally the middle of the night, thinking I'm in the hotel room and, and it's too dark to film. And I go, oh no, we can't film, we can't film, it's too dark. And here I was with a camera on my shoulder, couldn't see a thing. And I had to walk down these stairs. And Mark came around and he was holding, he couldn't see a thing, he was holding the camera so he could see where he candles, so he could see where he was going. Not holding up here, he was holding it down there. And they could see everything. It was fantastic. As he came around the corner, I could see him, I could see the candle. I followed him downstairs. He's met by his wife and one of his daughters. They're holding candles. They're lit. Go into the main hall and you've got all the, the soldiers and the courtier and his other family and they've all bought their candles. And that's it. That's what's lighting the scene. And it's beautiful. It looks like the paintings of the 16th century. I didn't want to use moonlight like daylight because it's not like that. It doesn't look like that. There's a scene where Joanne turns out all the candles one by one. And when I first saw that, I thought, well, how am I going to... If they turn out all the candles, it's going to be dark. But it, it worked, and the editor and the director were brave enough to hold that wide shot so you can actually see it going darker and darker and darker as Joanne goes around the room turning out the candles. But it's beautiful. It's mesmeric because you just focus in and in and in. At one point, she's just a silhouette against a wall. And it's... Just, I love that, that's cinema to me. And he's left with the firelight and one candle. It's so real. And I think the actors responded to that. You know, I remember very well when we lit Claire's uh, trial, the Amberlynn trial in episode six, just with candlelight in this big hall, just candles. And she came in and she gasped. She went, oh, it's like, a, it took her breath away. Cause it was so real. There was no lighting, there was no paraphernalia, it was just ca handheld camera. A room full of people in full costume. Uh, Mark Rylance, Bernard Hill at the end, all lit by candlelight in a 600-year-old building. And it was completely real, completely real. And it, I, think that, I think that informs everything. It informs what I do and it informs what the actors do, how they perform. To, to, to let that level of reality was, was great to do. You can't do it everything, it's not right for every film. But here, everything aligned, right? And it was valid. Normally with period film, there's a kind of, and it's, you can get into danger of, of, of stereotyping yourself. You go into sort of you filtration, you make it a bit softer, you might put lenses on the, nets on the back of the lens, or you use diffusion on the front. You might use vintage glass, you might use, you might desaturate the colours, you might put lots of smoke in to get nice shafts of light, and all of a sudden you're into your nice soft lit, chocolate boxy, shafty, lighty kind of look. And it can look lovely, that's why we do it, it's gorgeous. Everyone goes, wow. But I have saw so much of it. I started to not know what I was looking at. What film am I looking at here? Because everyone was doing that look. And again, I didn't want to dogmatically just reject that. But part of the process of finding these lenses and testing candles, we realized that filters weren't going to work. Because even the lightest diffusion filter, A, it did two things. One, it blew too much. It just blew everything. So if you did have a hot candle here, it would blow a load of halation over the actor's face. We didn't want to do that. 
We also found with a lot of candles, you're going to get reflections with the filters. Double reflections, they bounce off the lens and, or two of the filters and you get these double kicks and they're really hard to get rid of. And we didn't want to have time handheld trying to lose the, the double kicks on a camera. I didn't want to blow a take because of a, a, a reflection. And there was something about just the lens and the way it did halate very slightly the candlelight. There, there's, they're not pin sharp. If you look at the candle flame, there's a little gentle halation around it. And that was just enough for me. So we had a period film with no filtration at night. I did use filters in the day, which helped with um, uh, prosthetics and makeup and hair. At nighttime, no filters at all, no smoke, sharp lenses, natural lighting. And all of a sudden it started to, we, we had a look which didn't look like all the other period films. It was done the right way around. The look came out of the narrative, the way the director wanted to tell his story, and out of the way we were going to be able to film practically. Out of that, we got the look of Wolf Hall. It wasn't like, we'll just not do what they've done, or we'll use this lens that had been used before to make it look like something. It completely came out of our own story and the way we wanted to tell it. And I think that's the ideal way to go. That's when you get something original or unique because it hasn't been done before because that set of problems hasn't coincided before.